thank you so much, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. Um, this one is, this talk's just a little bit different than the preceding ones, and this is kind of how we bring all this learning down in operational uh, success in reducing food safety risk mitigation. Um, my co-author is Jeff Moore at USP. Our disclosure, I'm a volunteer with USP. I'm chair of the Food Ingredients Expert Committee, which uh, takes care of the Food Chemicals Codex. I have started a consulting firm called DeVries & Associates, where I'm an independent consultant. I'm chairman, CEO. I'm accountant. I fix the furnace. I fix the hot tub, because that's in my house. Um, so. It's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I also uh, have disclosed, I work for General Mills Medallion, and uh, due to the fact that I'm old enough to have a defined retirement plan, their success uh, affects my retirement pay. So, um, you know, obviously that's a disclosure. Uh, Jeff Moore is uh, my co-author, and he's the current director of food science uh, program at USP. Okay, what is the Food Chemicals Codex? We'll talk a little bit about the history. Uh, I'll try to give you some examples of how we improved uh, food safety in the past by reducing adverse potential effects. Uh, I'll try to give you some examples of current efforts, new monographs, and uh, uh, economically motivated elevation. Food Chemicals Codex was initiated in 1963 by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration working through the national uh, uh, academies of science, and I don't think there was a, there may not have been an Institute of Medicine then, it was probably another division. Anyway, the initial focus was on food additives, uh, probably a follow-up to the 1958 uh, Food Additives Amendment, often known as the Delaney Clause, uh, dealing with grass ingredients and, and uh, normally used food. They took a monograph approach to food quality, uh, because when you use a monograph system as it's being used, you get to apply currently available knowledge and capabilities and setting specifications, and then you also provide the analytical methods necessary to enforce the specifications. Uh, you probably can't read the fine print, but over on the right, um, it's uh, Dr. James Goddard, who was uh, an MD uh, commissioner of the FDA at the time, who in 1966 declared that the Food Chemicals Codex uh, monographs represent food grade material. It doesn't exclude other materials, but it does provide um, that fact. Okay, and it has the force of law in some jurisdictions, such as Canada, Australia, Israel, and uh, certain other uh, jurisdictions. The Food Chemicals Codex was put together with an expert committee and the uh, um, National Academies, people from academia, government, uh, industry, there were toxicologists, food scientists, chemists. First edition was published in 1966, basically determined the authenticity, quality, and purity uh, by essential criteria. And a big thing here was allowing non scientific personnel a means of applying scientifically based sound specifications so that the purchasing or, uh, agent in virtually in any company, probably working with their quality people, can simply require that the ingredients they're buying are uh, food chemical codex grade, and thus they'll meet these standards for purity and quality and safety. Um, and then in, in 2006, uh, U.S. Uh, Pharmacopeia acquired the FCC. Now, USP now has a mission to improve global health through public standards related programs uh, for quality, safety, or benefit of medicines and foods. Uh, USP has been around since the 1820s uh, dealing with medicines. And so the, uh, the, the transfer of the Food Chemicals Codex, and they're also using the monograph systems, the transfer of Food Chemicals Codex into USP was a, a very logical and good fit. Um, and the aim of the food program as we now have it is to improve the confidence and in the integrity of the global food supply uh, using scientific based standards, tools, and services. Uh, the has strong scientific leadership 
200 years of experience in, uh, in medical standards, as I said, uh, over 50 years now in the Food Chemicals Codex between the National Academies and uh, USP. And uniformity, equality, and assurance of safety are key goals. It's all volunteer-based uh, with staff support, bringing the best global expertise and thinking to inform our work. USP is deeply committed to innovate and provide practical solutions to support their mission. Okay, Food Chemicals Codex are internationally recognized standards uh, used with specifications, supporting reference materials for uniformity, equality, safety, and integrity. And as I pointed out with that letter from Dr. James Goddard, uh, basically defines food grade. Uh, our scope includes food additives, colors that are generally considered grass, processing aids such as enzymes, extraction solvents, boiler water additives, so forth, foods themselves, whey, sucrose, oils, food starch, and then functional ingredients uh, added not because of their function in the foods, but the function in the human body when the food is conserved, such as uh, krill oil and uh, probiotics. How does the FCC help protect the safety and integrity of the ingredients? Well, we basically set the chemical compositions in terms of identity, purity, and allowed or disallowed impurities. And the objective is to provide equivalence to that material that was shown to be safe in the original toxicological studies. Uh, combine that with safe levels of impurities and contaminants that um, are believed to be in the best, uh, lowest risk. And then also set up methods uh, within a monograph to help detect fraudulent dilution or substitution, which can in, uh, impact the uh, integrity and safety. Um, just an example of, of things we've done. In the 60s to 90s, wet chemistry methods were all that was available for lead. Uh, we used something called a heavy metals test, and you would shake this solution. And if you got a black precipitate, it was uh, considered positive, and it was uh, 10 ppm of heavy metals expressed as lead. Okay, in the 80s and 90s, atomic absorption and graphite of furnace absorption, atomic absorption came along. As chemists, this gave us greater analytical uh, capability because now we could separate out the metals of concern, and we had greater sensitivity so we could set lower specification. At the same time, there was significant knowledge coming out about lead's negative effects. So, ILSI set up a project. In fact, it was the very first project for the uh, current uh, ILSI Carbohydrate Committee. And I was invited to uh, help work with this. And what we were doing was looking at lead and sweeteners in uh, uh, sucrose, uh, high fructose, corn syrup, dextrose, and so forth. The big concern was with the 10 ppm specification, somebody might run a, uh, a risk analysis on lead exposure and consider all the sweeteners consumed, you'd come up with a pretty uh, scary number. Um, so what he did was worked with the NFPA, worked with the USDA, and uh, we had General Mills, and we proved that the analytical capability we could achieve was down to less than 100 parts per billion, or less than a tenth of a ppm. Went out and surveyed uh, sur a lot of sweeteners, found no detectable lead anywhere, worked with the Food Chemicals Codex, and got the up monographs upgraded to less than uh, 0.1 ppm. Uh, similarly, in the 20 years that I've been on the Food Chemicals Codex committees, uh, we've done the same with other metals, and we've adopted, changed the policies on those and uh, fluoride as well. So, uh, I think this is an example of contaminants of risk, such as lead, and the food supply can be significantly reduced uh, between a combination of improved analytical technologies and commensurate changes in specifications. We have to grant there's other, uh, other things going on, such as elimination of leaded gasoline and so forth, but in fact, we're staying in touch with what we can reasonably achieve within the food supply. Uh, food fraud, that's uh, kind of on everybody's mind since 2007. Uh, why do something about it? 
and what kind of tools does USP have uh, to look at this. Uh, basically, it's a global problem. Headlines from all over indicate uh, the extent of it without uh, any uh, doubt that, that uh, it's not just a U.S. problem or a single company problem. It uh, has some very severe consequences. Um, food fraud always cheats the consumers. Uh, in addition, a lot of times when it's discovered, it has significant cost to food producers, food handlers, and it erodes consumer confidence. And when it goes wrong, it introduces food safety hazards. You have to remember that when economic adulteration is taking place, you're leaving your food safety in the hands of somebody who may or may not be trained in it. Their only purpose is to make money. And um, it's taken it out of the normal channels for food safety and leaving it in the hands of those people who are crooks. Um, basically, uh, just to remind everybody, um, not a cheery picture anywhere here of some of the consequences and some of the issues we've just had in the last 10 or so years, including some that go way back to the 80s, the beech nut example and fruit juices. Um, so. And many, what we find is many of the paths for supplies and orders and so forth are very complex, uh, which allows a lot of points of entry of economic adulteration um, in, into many food ingredients. So why can't we, why we can't ignore it? Uh, it occurs frequently. Uh, UK uh, Food Safety Authority estimates that up to 10% of the food uh, has some sort of adulterant in it. Uh, it's usually not detected, as low as about 4% of the time. Why is it so low? Well, the perpetrators of this, really it's in their best interest not to have a safety issue and not to be detected. If they have a safety issue, they get caught. They also have problems for consumers. Uh, so it really behooves them to keep this uh, under covers and make it difficult to detect. Uh, and as we saw in the case of the melamine, uh, it can be a significant public health harm if the per perpetrators do it wrong. Melamine, as you know, if you look up in the standard tox literature, has very low toxicity. But when you feed it, mix it with uh, milk, skim milk powders or regular milk powders, bake infant formula, you are changing the whole scenario because now all of a sudden you have a being who has very small kidney tubules, and you also have a being who is on a constant diet. Instead of getting a dose of melamine, they're getting a constant dose of melamine. And when you get the interaction of melamine and uric acid, as you know, as we now know, uh, it forms these crystals. And so in any adult, you would probably find no toxicity for melamine, but for somebody on a constant diet, constant input, and um, having very small kidney tubules, you have a perfect storm for a major disaster. And the same way with pets, they get the same, same thing. They have constant diet, people feed their pets the same thing, so if it's contaminated with melamine, they have small kidney tubules and, and you have the same effect happening there. And it makes it even worse when you use scrap grade melamine that happens to have cyanuric acid in it, that forms a complex more quickly even than uh, melamine and uric acid. So, and of course we all know it causes financial harm and industry and consumer always get cheated. Uh, we can't ignore it. Food Safety uh, Modernization Act now requires the recognition that some food fraud results in food safety issues and the burden is now on food facilities to identify those hazards and evaluate its significance and implement preventative controls. Under the FISMA, or a GFSI, recognizes again that can be a food safety consequence, and in the upcoming 2016 uh, requirements, um, they're going to have a guidance document about managing and, and uh, controlling economically motivated adulteration, excuse me. It's a real challenge. Criminals design adulterants to evade the existing QA systems, and we in turn in the QA business 
uh, react by developing new tests, and when we do that, then the criminals work to design adulterants to evade us again. So what we need to do as industry and regulators is a, take a risk-based approach uh, to ferret this out. Where to start? Where to focus? Um, well, at USP, we decided we're going to identify the riskiest food ingredients to focus our, uh, our limited resources in this area. And uh, do this by understanding the past. As Dwight Eisenhower says, don't lay down in front of the train of history and get run over um, with, by the future. Um, anyway, uh, so to complete our knowledge, of the more complete knowledge we have of the past, the better our ability to anticipate uh, what the future is going to bring. So in 2012, we introduced the first public database on food fraud, which now is up to uh, 2,000 plus records. It's available for anybody at www.foodfraud.org. Um, and, and basically, it takes all the ingredients that we could find in the published technical literature, media literature, it um, breaks these out in terms of the fraud history with that ingredient, the potential hazards, and the available detection methods. It's, uh, uh, like I said, if you go to the website, you can go, it's fully searchable. You can search by ingredient, such as paprika here. You can search by adulterant. Uh, you can search by food types. And all of these are, as I said, um, from literature, peer-reviewed literature, um, or if they're from media stories, uh, they're so indicated. Um, you go to that database, as 165,000 people already have from 198 countries, you find 2,600 records, and it includes 600 ingredients. Some examples are flags, such as melamine, uh, spices cut with peanut materials, adulteration of spice with lead chromate as happened in India, uh, dilution of milk powders with maltodextrin as happened in South America, uh, replacement of milk fat with vegetable oils in South America. Uh, you can read more about it in this article, 2012 article, that talks about how we implemented it. Um, and, and how do you use it? Well, if you're the QA person, the toxicologist, purchasing agent, if you look in this database uh, for materials and you're buying maltodextrin, there's no history, no pattern. So, you know, it's probably not too likely that your maltodextrin is going to be um, an EMA hazard. On the other hand, if we look up spices, we find a very clear pattern of adulteration. Uh, we find 350 records and 223 different uh, adulterants, 35 of which are potential safety concerns like industrial dyes, uh, lead chromate, uh, peanut materials, and so forth. So spices, uh, you would say, have a, a pretty substantial risk and, and have to require more attention. So what did we learn from all this? Well, the lesson learned is EME is a significantly prevalent factor in the food supply. We need more efforts to tighten things up, and constant surveillance uh, and vigilance is necessary. Put together another guidance, another tool, which is a food mitigation guidance document, which looks at the vulnerabilities to uh, <coughs> EMA and combines it with an impact assessment and so that individuals or companies can take action-oriented food mitigation uh, uh, actions. Uh, do the uh, vulnerability characterization with the factors assessment, and uh, then we uh, can look at a mitigation strategy development, factors and impacts. So contributing factors, what you'll find in that guidance is a list of uh, contributing factors down the left side across the top. You'll have the various degrees of risk that you'll probably incur. And in each square, you'll have a definition of what is believed to be the factors that go into that risk. And combined with that are subsections down below that uh, describe it further if you need that information. Uh, so it talks about your supply chain, uh, you know, from open market all the way down to doing it yourself and what the risks are. 
Uh, we talk about the analytical situations, uh, like pomegranate juice, which has very complex variable makeup and has only very weak tests uh, associated with it. Uh, we talk about economic factors. Uh, whenever you see such a significant rise in a ingredient or commodity, you typically have a high risk of EMA because the temptation skyrockets. Uh, having done that, uh, the, the scientist does a, a food safety uh, assessment relative to whether it's going to impact the product, a safety perspective, also economic perspective. And then there's certain multipliers, such as does this food or ingredient you're buying go to a uh, subpopulation, infants or whatever. Okay. Uh, in any case, uh, having done that, you combine the two, and then in case of maltodextrin, you can see um, you're in a green area. Very little risk of, of adulteration and, and very little negative impact with the things that would likely be adulterated with. On the other hand, if you look at spices, uh, it very clearly requires that you take extra action to assure against EMA. And then finally, apply a mitigation strategy which reduces the risk factors. Um, you can't do anything about the uncontrolled ones, but the fact is if you do something about the top ones, uh, you can reduce your risk substantially or your vulnerability. How is approach developed? We did it with an open and transparent uh, system working with uh, government people, academicians, um, industry experts, and put together this entire guidance. After it was done, we invited a substantial group of uh, multinational industry experts in and had them go through this, and we wanted to ensure that it was practical and compatible and workable. So I think a very good thing. Finally, our last tool, trust but verify, according to Reagan, and this would be compendial standards, <coughs> where instead of looking at what should not be there, Divine very carefully what should be there and exclude everything else uh, that should not be there. That would be our FCC. So what, what are we working on next? Uh, trying to put together databases of reference materials so that we can do answers in seconds that can be done at the loading docks or uh, various other uh, receiving stations. Uh, this proves to be typically more difficult than you would think on the surface because establishing authentic, authentic databases is tough. And then you have to have the uh, wherewithal to decide when something is really different than what it should be, whether you've uh, done it by um, chromatography or uh, uh, spectral analysis, or photographs or whatever. Um, but that's a work in progress that's actually proceeding well. Uh, we're going to update our food fraud database and uh, include a new literature search to expand it. Uh, we'll adapt it to uh, FISMA and uh, GFSI. We're going to increase user friendliness. We're looking at additional features and user options. And we're looking at, we've, we've put on one training course and USP will be putting on additional training courses in the future and maybe uh, look at potential future services to individual companies. Okay, um, so we'll exp also expand our monograph base. We have new ingredient materials uh, to be looked at all the time. Uh, we're doing an EMA a vulnerability assessment. This is being done with the food perfection food protection, well, perfection too, uh, Food Protection and Defense Institute of the University of Minnesota. We've already evaluated over 50% of the monographs and see which ones need to be uh, improved or changed to uh, reduce EMA risk. Um, we're looking at producing Food Fraud Database 2.0, which will be our next generation tool. And then we've set up a volunteer hazard analysis identification expert panel. And we've got these 2,600 entries with some 300 and some adulterants in there. And what this panel's been uh, charged to do is set up a system of uh, saying 
what level of hazard are these adulterants, and then review the adulterants and assign a hazard level so that the average scientist or person, technical person in your organization can look at this and say, well, the potential adulterant from this is such and such, and, but it's not a safety hazard. So when you're doing your mitigation work or your uh, evaluation work, vulnerability work, it's not the safety hazard, but it could have a huge economic impact and so forth. So that should be a very valuable addition to the database. We're also reinitiating the expert uh, adulteration panel that I chaired for the last five years, and Henry Chin will be chairing that. I won't talk about the details. We want to share our information with everybody, and we want to set up collaborative research to deal with food fraud. Uh, especially with new analytical technologies where we work with people to validate them. So finally, in conclusion, we're committed, USP is committed to help the food committee, community implement practical solutions, deal with food fraud, uh, smart science-based manner. Uh, we want to use uh, the tools that we have, the guidance uh, uh, document, the food fraud database, and the FCC uh, monographs, and in the future, the advanced database training and, and uh, capability uh, uh, services, analytical services are in development. And of course, all these challenges indicate that we've got to work together to make it happen.